Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. As always, each and every week, we are here bringing the VRIC to you with our series of online expert panels. We have another banger for you today. We've got Alistair McLeod of Gold Money and Michael Oliver of Momentum Structural Analysis. We're going to be discussing gold, silver, as well as getting their thoughts on the broad markets and the economy. Gentlemen, it's an honor to have you both on the show. Thank you for asking me. Good to be here. Well, let's start with a broader view of the economy and markets before we hone in on precious metals. So I'd like to ask both of you, what do you think are the main trends currently taking place in financial markets and the economy that investors should be paying attention to right now? And Alistair, I'll start with you. Well, I think, um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's Macbeth had it right, you know, Hubble, bubble, toil and trouble. I mean, this is a bit of a bubble. Um, and I think the thing that um, the, the sort of mainstream has got completely wrong is the outlook for interest rates. Now, this is desperately important. Uh, the U.S. Treasury is in a debt trap. Simple as that. I think this year uh, we're likely to see um, a budget deficit in excess of three trillion. Um, now, what that means is that the debasement of the currency is still feeding um, uh, uh, higher prices, if you like, inflation into the system. So the idea that the inflation story is dead is completely wrong. Now, not only that, but so far, the US government has been funding itself uh, on the short end. It's been uh, basically issuing T-bills, uh, that sort of thing, and tapping into um, the um, uh, uh, money funds, which have been, you know, which are coming out of the reverse repo facility from the Fed and just buying T-bills. They're getting 5.3, 5.4%. What's not to like about that? Um they have yet to test uh, the water when it comes to funding serious amounts of uh, debt along the yield curve. And I think they're going to find that um, when they try and do that, the yield curve will first flatten from being negative. And I think after that, it will go strongly positive. Why? Because there really aren't buyers out there for the sort of quantities we are talking about. And not only that, but really what you know, the role of interest rates is to reward, if you like, the buyers of bonds, um, the depositors, whatever, for the increased risk of holding dollars. And when the purchasing power of the dollar is going down in the way it is, then there's any, you know, you can only conclude one thing, and that's interest rates are rising. Now, that's desperately important. We can see that uh, the US government is in a debt trap, but it is also not much fun for the private sector. Um, you know, there are loads of malinvestments around. Um, not only that, but I mean, you look at things like, uh, you know, the private equity business. How did private equity work? Well, basically, they took a steady income stream, leveraged it up five times debt to equity. Um, and that was brilliant. Well, interest rates were declining over a period, over a long period. And it was brilliant when they were zero. But now they're up and are going to go further. What's that going to do to that sort of industry? It's going to take it apart. I mean, we already have in this country, Thames Water, one of the biggest water utility, um, you know, is, is technically bust because it is over leveraged on debt, which can no longer no longer afford um, at, um, you know, at new rates. So I think that is probably the most important thing behind markets, the interest rate outlook. Uh, to my mind, it is quite simple. This is like, rather like a return to the 70s. I mean, off camera, we were talking about uh, our early days, <laughs> 70s. Um, and uh, I mean, I remember uh, the UK um, Treasury having to issue gilts, and this is a, they issued um, a twenty-year gilt with a fifteen and a half percent coupon at a discount in order to get it away. I mean, the top of the yield, you know, the highest yield on those um, long gilt twenty-year, twenty-five-year gilts was seventeen point one percent. Now. You know, we've got the same conditions that are likely to drive U.S. Treasuries in that direction. I wouldn't be surprised if it would exceed those levels. But you can see that this is actually the makings of an enormous crisis. And I think that markets not to understand is a huge, huge mistake. Um, and uh, I think it's just completely wrongly priced. So anyway, my summary. 
And Michael, your thoughts, um, what do you agree with? Anything that you perhaps take the opposite side of in regards to what Alistair has said and, and any other trends or themes that you're watching in the markets right now, you think it's important for people to be to have their eyes on? I agree. Thumbs up with Alistair's comments. Okay, so no no objection to anything he said. Uh, we're looking at things technically and also you could just look at it fundamentally in this way. The boom bust cycles created by the Fed are recurring, you know, for the last hundred years. They did it in 23 through 29. They pumped up the money supply. The market went up, then we crashed. Okay. And then since our my company was founded in 1992, we've had the peak in 2000, the peak in 2007. And now I think we've got a huge bubble, much bigger than any of those prior, what we call bubbles. Remember the dot-com bubble? Okay. And that's what the, uh, at that point uh, in 2000, we call the top and the mo annual momentum of the market at that point, when we measure the monthly action of the market against, let's say a 36 month average, not just laying an average on the chart, but oscillating it. You, you create a totally different picture. It looks just like now. And back then, when you initially broke the momentum structure, in other words, you broke the integrity of the prior, I guess it had been a five-year uptrend at that point. And the S&P had only doubled during that time, by the way. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. It went up 3.5 times during that. But it was only a five-year bull trend and a tripling and a half. We'll get to the current market in a minute. And when you broke, you had devastation. I mean, the NASDAQ 100 dropped 82% over the next two years. So, and again, there was a story then, oh, the internet's going to change your life. No, they were right. Totally right. In fact, they were they understated how it changes. And yet, NASDAQ 100 dropped 82%. Okay. Then we get to the 2007 period. Again, that's a bull market from the late 2002 low to late 2007. So, five years. Uh we also had a real estate bubble at that time. You know, we, we all know that. And that's what helped take it under. Uh, that market only uh, like doubled for the S&P. And yet you had a disaster in 2008 and 9 where people on the street were hurting. You know, it was real world pain, not just the one percenters who were in the stock market. This is far worse. This is now a 14, 15 year old bull market, triple the age of those. The NASDAQ 100 has gone up 18 fold. S&P has gone up sevenfold. So in, in multiples of, of, of advance, well, why, why did that happen? Look at a Fed funds rate chart. Go back to 1992 to 94. They filled the gas tank with money. And then came the dot-com bubble. Then again, from 2001 through 2003 or so, they kept rates at about 1%. And they filled the gas tank again for the next bubble, which helped real estate. And now, though it's been zero rates with that one deviation up to 2.4 that occurred, lasted for about a year and then came back to zero for a dozen years. So they filled the tank and you had a huge move. When the bubble breaks, the pain in the street will be horrific. It'll, it'll make 2009 look like a, a, a passing thing. Uh, so there's a lot of devastation out there. We're measuring it technically. We think the market effectively topped in early 2022. In fact, most indexes, most subsectors of the market did peak then. You haven't returned there. It's only because of a handful of stocks that are so heavily weighted that it doesn't matter what the 900, uh, uh, what the, uh, the, the 90 or so stocks in the NASDAQ 100 are doing at the back end. It only matters what the first 10 are doing. And the S&P, same story, the back 450 don't matter. It's the front 50 or the front five. So it's a totally distorted picture. And when it comes undone, there'll be real world consequences. So many, think of it this way. You're a businessman. You don't know much about economics, okay? But you make financial decisions based on various factors. You know, how well is my product doing? Uh, what's the labor cost? And also, what is the cost of money? So when you make a long-term investment decision, whether it's a family building a larger house or a company expanding or municipal government or even federal government, you base it, one of the largest factors is the cost of money. And if that's fake out for a dozen years, you've been faked out. You've had an injection in your arm, in effect. You've been in hallucination. Uh, and all of a sudden they yank it out. The, the, the myriad of micro failures that will occur 
and macro failures. It's hard to define them, you know, and so that will be exposed. And so I think it's, uh, it's, it's at hand right now. I think we're watching the NASDAQ and the S&P, for example, right now on a, on a shorter term basis. And I'll tell you this, if you go about a percent below the low of this week, we're headed down. We've started the process. Uh, and, and at that point, the data points that all the people like to look at will suddenly then follow the market. They won't lead the market down. And uh, that's what we're facing. I think it's inevitable. And I think gold, for example, knows that. What, what does gold know? It knows, hey, you know, they're going to have to go berserk again, the central banks. No matter what they're talking about now, they have to go berserk again. Uh, because if they don't, the whole thing crashes down on them. And gold is, uh, you know, it's a wise market. It doesn't wait for the for the the event. It anticipates the event. Well, let's discuss yeah, I, gold's role then. And uh, Alistair, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry. Can ahead. I just, just add to, to, to what yeah. Mike was saying? Um, I mean, the key thing about uh, falling financial asset values is that they will be driven down by the interest rate situation. I think that should be obvious to everybody. But the same thing affects property values. Now, if you look at property values, they are the collateral in the banking system for virtually everything. I mean, you know, the commercial real estate uh, um, problems in America have caught the headlines, but it doesn't stop there. It goes into domestic mortgages and everything. And around the world, I think there's something like, um, I, I came, found a figure the other day, something like 500 and, I don't know, 30 trillion or something is the value of the global property market. That is the basis of pretty much all bank lending, apart from uh, the financial you know, uh, aspect of it. Um, you know, which is another huge lump, what, 150, I think portfolios are, are said to be worth roughly 140 trillion around the world. So, you know, when these values fall, the banks are in trouble. And not only the banks, but if you look at the central bank's balance sheets, I mean, I I, I did a, an article for my Substack um, uh, uh, channel uh, the other day, looking at, uh, um, you know, the Japanese, the Bank of Japan. I mean, it is just absolutely staggering. It's got 100 uh, million yen of equity capital. That is exceeded by the losses on uh, its portfolio. It, I mean, it, it owns something like 60% of the JGB market. The losses on its portfolio since um, uh, late 2020 look to me to be roughly 700 times its capital. I mean... You know, and these are the guys who are backstopping the whole of the commercial banking system. Yeah, you know, so this is not a trivial matter. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that one in. <laughs> yeah, much appreciated. I do want to pivot to Gold's role in all of this. Obviously, we've seen it have a strong performance so far this year, reaching new nominal all-time highs in in U.S. dollar terms. Um, what do you think are the main catalysts that brought us here? And how do you forecast the gold market performing for the remainder of the year? And Michael, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, well, again, technically based, but also looking back in time. Uh, first off, this gold bull market is, is not a new one. Okay, It began in December of 2015 at a price of 1,046 low in US dollar terms. Okay, so we doubled between then and 2020. And by the way, other bull markets over the last 50 years, you can look at the mid 1970s to the 1980s, that's seven, eight years of upside from $30 range to 850. And then you went from 250 in the year 2000. And by 2011, you were 1920. So, you know, a huge multiple game, but a lot of years involved there. Okay. Uh, same here. This one's now, you know, getting into its ninth year or so. Uh, so it's, we ex usually at the tail end of those bull markets is when the cataclysmic events start to occur, that suddenly everybody wakes up and realizes what's been going on. And you also get price drama in the late part of those bull trends, especially what you get, for example, with silver in relation to gold. During much of those bull trends, we, the other, prior two bull trends, silver went along with gold, but in a sloppy manner. You know, it wasn't an outperformer. But at the tail end of those moves, it, it, it left the earth on a percentage basis. It, it was like off the page. Uh, you know, you go from $15 silver to 50 in 12 months, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's what we're facing this time. Now, we measure that a couple of ways. Uh, and one is the spread relationship between silver and gold. You could plot it, you know. 
And uh, then we do momentum studies of that spread. And right now I can tell you, if you get much more uptick in the price of silver in relation to gold. Now, if you go back to the February low, silver's outperformed gold. So have the gold miners. They've doubled the performance of gold from the February low I'm talking about. So in the recent surge, they beat gold. If they continue to do that just a bit more, they're going to go into first place again, where they outperform gold going forward, which is typical in the latter phases of major bull markets. So as far as price targets, you know, we've thrown out one before that people chuckle at, and that's $8,000 gold. Well, all that is is looking back at the prior two bull, major bull markets and looking at the multiples that were gained by gold then based on far less dramatic fundamentals. And if you do it again, you're going to get 8,000. That's just routine. That's just another echo effect of the prior two. Uh, and given the fundamentals that Alistair is aware of and, and that I'm aware of, uh, this could be far worse. And also, I don't expect it to be arm wrestling. A lot of this bull market the last nine years has been arm wrestling process. You know, you gain two steps, you pull back one, you bore the heck out of people, you spook them. But finally, in the latter phases of the bull market, you get the exaggerated moves with speed and dynamics. And I think we're on the cusp of that right now. And Alistair, your thoughts on gold's recent price action, where you see it headed in the catalysts that, that have brought us here and will continue to drive the gold market? Well, I'm very interested to hear, um, you know, the technical position, which uh, I think Michael has outlined um, very, very clearly. Um, but the fundamental position, you have to look at it a different way. Um, it's not gold going up, it's the dollar going down. And it's not just the dollar going down, it's every fiat currency. Um, why do I say that? Well, um, this is actually, I mean, gold is legal money. I mean, we go back to Roman times. They set this out in the 12 tables back in 550 BC. Um, and various jurors sort of worked on that very, very slim um, basis to come up with uh, the definitions of uh, between money and credit, for example. Now, money was always physical gold. Credit was something which where you owed something. So, um, you know, under the gold standard, um, you know, the dollar um, wasn't, you know, it was credit, um, even though it was a gold substitute. Um, nowadays, of course, it's not a gold substitute. Uh, but the idea that, that the dollar is now money and gold is a pet rock actually goes completely against uh, the legalities of the situation. It is, in effect, uh, status propaganda. Um, the way you must always look at a currency against gold is that if it is not anchored to gold, its purchasing power goes down. And it goes down for two reasons. Firstly, um, governments always use it as, um, you know, the, the senior ridge, if you like, that they get out of printing money without any apparent consequences, without the public actually realizing what's going on. Um, and uh, you know the, the you know the the whole thing about this is is, is that um, you know with this sort of seniorage thing, um, you know over a period of time, you know the idea of sort of two percent, two percent, two percent every year. Well, actually, uh, with the gold price having gone from thirty five dollars to the ounce to currently over uh, twenty one hundred to the ounce, I mean that is a devaluation uh, of um, nearly ninety nine percent for the dollar. Uh, that is the reality of the situation. Now, if you understand that it's the dollar going down, not gold going up, then you can deduce two things from that. First of all, if we see the dollar going down and down and down, then the 8,000 target, which Michael was referring to, becomes uh, not you know, something like a pipe dream or something, um, you know, an exaggeration or, um, you know, my God, you know, it's, this, this is a speculation. It becomes actually quite understandable. And only then do you find a situation where you get a panic out of fiat currencies into gold. Now, at that stage, you could say that gold is actually beginning to rise because of the weight of, um, uh, if you like, the weight coming out of credit, trying to get the hell out of collapsing credit. You know, this is the, the crack up boom, if you like, which will drive up the gold price relative to these fiat currencies. But I think that's the key thing. The way to look at it is that it's not gold going up at the moment. It's currencies going down because they've got no anchor in value whatsoever. 
And I mean, the, the, you know, the other thing is that, you know, people sort of think that um, uh, this is tied, if you like, to the quantity of money, you know, the sort of the monetarist approach. I mean, there is obviously, a, uh, you know, a quantitative uh, factor in this. Um, you know, if, if the central bank expands credit, then it's going to tend to undermine uh, prices. But the idea that there's a constant relationship is is complete nonsense. What these currencies really depend on at the end of the day is not, you know, interest rates, whatever, whatever. It's faith in the currency. And what we are seeing, particularly with the geopolitical developments that we've had in the last two or three years, is we're seeing the faith in the dollar actually being badly eroded. And that is why the relationship is that the dollar is going down and it makes it appear as if the gold as if gold is going up. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. Well, Alistair, you recently wrote an article on King World News about India creating a short squeeze in the silver market. And um, I'd like to turn to silver now because obviously, uh, Michael, as you said, it can outperform in the latter stages of a precious metals bull market. But at the moment, you know, around $25, and that's getting people really excited. Um, but it's nowhere near all time highs. Uh, so, Alistair, could you expand on that article for us? And then, Michael, I'd also like to get your thoughts on the silver market from a technical perspective, too. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were two aspects of this market. I mean, it must have been over 10 years ago, I was speaking at a mining conference in New, in New York, and there were quite a lot of uh, silver um, exploration companies and mines um, exhibiting at that conference. And at the time, people were running around saying that, you know, uh, JP Morgan are in the market and they're being there, you know, they bash the silver price every what you know, you're getting all this sort of conspiracy theory stuff. Um, and it didn't make an awful lot of sense to me in some respects. And I thought, well, I need to really try and find out what's going on. And so I the answer I got from virtually every um exhibitor, silver exhibitor at that conference, was that um the way they handle their product, you know, it comes out as Dory on site. Um, the man from Trafigura or is it Glencore comes along and he certifies it. And that certification allows the bank, um, surprise, surprise, most probably JP Morgan, to advance the money to pay the wages of the miners and all the other costs. And the Dory is then shipped off for refining. Where, I asked? Oh, well, they didn't know. Well, the answer basically is because it's a pretty filthy business refining silver, it went to China. And then you've got the other side of the deal. Um, you know, th once, once um, uh, it, it goes to China, then either JP Morgan get pay paid or acting on behalf of the Chinese government, they then sell it in the market. The point is that this, you know, the relationship between China and JP Morgan allows China to suppress the silver price. That was what was going on. So when Blythe Masters went on television to um, you know, deny that JP Morgan had a, a position as principal in the market, she was absolutely right. Yeah, they were acting on behalf of China. It wasn't their own book, it was, but it, it amounts to the same thing, if you like. So China has been controlling the price. And I think that explains why. Um, you know, we've had a situation where uh, the gold-silver ratio peaked up at something like 120. It's currently looking sort of, you know, 83, 84, something like that. That is why it is at that level, uh, which is which is crazy. Um, but uh, then um, I'm sure uh, you will have noticed that um, in the last um, 10 days or so, an enormous amount of uh, silver has been stood for delivery on COMEX. And, it, um, you know, when I originally looked at this, um, uh, a source in the industry uh, told me, well, you know, the answer to this basically is that the Indian government are subsidizing um, uh, photovoltaic cell production. Uh, this is obviously the new big thing. Um, and, you know, I can see from the Indian government's point of view, it, if you like, gives them some sort of argument against, uh, you know, the critics who are saying, but hold on, you're opening coal-fired power stations, you know, you know, the sort of thing. This is, this is essentially political. 
But the point is that Reliance Industries, one of the big uh, conglomerates there, um, is involved in this business. And uh, it was opening this very month, month um, the first phase of its new production facility, uh, which is to produce, um, uh, I think it was over 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 5,000 uh, uh, um, of these, sorry, 5 million, or five, you know, whatever the number is, huge, huge, huge numbers of these photovoltaic cells. And they're, they're expanding the factory um, to go up to around about, uh, you know, 20, 20 billion, 20 million, whatever. I can't remember how many zeros we're talking about. But you can see that there's a lot of silver demanded. And um, when you look at the amount of silver that's been delivered on COMEX this year alone, it amounts at 1,201 tons. Um, this is an enormous amount. You know, this is not a market where deliveries were very rarely meant to take place. I mean, the you know, the idea at the end of the contract is it sort of ties the contract value into the, the physical price. But, you know, this is not an invitation to, to deliver. Um, but that is the way it has gone. And the reason it's gone that way is because of this enormous demand, um, uh, industrial demand for silver. And I think... Um, and uh, my sources also think that this is going to lead to China losing control over the silver price. So that's basically what I was writing about. Fascinating. And Michael, your thoughts and the, the setup you're currently seeing for silver from a technical perspective? Well, aside from the likelihood it's going to shift to an outperformer to gold, which I think is 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 very ripe, technically speaking, uh, and we define that in our reports. And same is true with the miners, by the way. The gold miners and silver miners are probably more undervalued to the U.S. stock market and more undervalued to gold than they've ever been in history. You know, like we don't need gold miners. You know, what's under the ground there? Gold? Oh, we don't, you know, whether you want gold, but you don't care about the miners? Okay. Anyway, uh, I think they're going to slingshot. But we measure that technically. Silver right now is at an interesting place when you look at its annual momentum. Again, I spoke of the stock market having a topping pattern on annual momentum, which I think has already been initially triggered. And when you top on an old bull market, it takes a while to top out. So it's not an instant thing. But in the case of silver, we've spent the last, since 2022, 23 and into 24, two and a half years now, where if you look at the price of silver, it's sort of a staircasing down, but it's irregular which you can't really draw a good line. It doesn't have multi-points that all line up or a flat ceiling. But when you look at annual momentum, it's a perfectly flat ceiling. I mean, we've hit it like three, four times. It's a very shallow level on the oscillator. I mean, silver gets only a few percent above its 36-month average and pulls back. Does the same thing later. Same. So you built a structure, which you cannot see on price, which is the kind of thing we look for in momentum. You're at that structure now. In fact, if you close out this month, we do it on a monthly closing basis, uh, at uh, 25, 27 or higher, you're breaking out. And we've traded above there this month using May silver. Uh, and we're slightly below there now, but there's a week and a half to go. Uh, you close 25, 27 or higher, and the number adjusts down about a dime a month, by the way. Uh, you're launching. As far as we're concerned, you will see over the six subsequent six months a likely technical launch in silver where its dynamics suddenly go from this sloppy holding pattern we've had for the last three and a half years to something that surprises people, you know, uh, much like you remember the, the 2000, uh, March, 2020, July, 2020, silver went from $14 to 30, six months. Okay. People were shocked by that. There was a similar, but lesser structure then on momentum. This time we have a pristine. If you saw the momentum chart, you would say, Oh boy, but most people don't see it. Uh, and I'm saying right now we're on the cusp. Miners have something very, very similar using GDX. It has an annual momentum structure where at its 36 month average, it's bumped it, bumped it, bumped it for two and a half years. So it's a perfectly flat structure. You do not see it on price. So again, as technicians looking at the momentum, the structure, I'm telling you, you're on the cusp right now. All you have to do is close out this month, basically a point higher than we've been in GDX this month, meaning get up over 31. And silver's already been above its number. So and at that point, I think the tone will change in the market. Now, what other factors might help that? I'm suspecting strongly that you'll start to see a slab type decay in the stock market. Where it suddenly starts to give them not a crash that could happen, but that's not going to happen right away. That looks like something that's 
you'd have to get the S&P down to around 4,300. Right now, where are we? 50, you know, you've got to drop 10, 12%. You get down to 4,300 again, and you could get a crash effect in the S&P. But the shift in the stock market to the downside is going to what? There's a lot of asset managers out there who've already expressed skepticism about the market. Why? Because they've been around long enough. They know better. They know what an extremely limited market is in terms of leadership. And they're doubtful, but they have to be in the market because they have a product. And if they're not in it and some other guy's loaded up in stocks and he's beating their performance, they're going to lose their base. So they have to be there. But if you give them even a modest excuse, moderate excuse to get worried again, like suddenly, oh, S&P just dropped 5%. Hmm. The technician comes up to him and says, we just broke something, boss. You know, uh, you'll start to have asset movement out of that category. And I'm arguing it likely it's going to go into the gold miners and so on. Now, we've already had a few major asset managers over the last month announce they're evacuating from high to some high tech stocks, the leadership symbols, and they're moving into what? New modern barrack, the blue chips. Uh, and they see something. They see something that we see technically. They see it fundamentally. And all it takes is a little shaking of that stock market. And I think the asset class, asset flows will begin. And when you go into a small, tiny sector like gold miners, it doesn't take much. It's like everybody grabbing a wet bar of soap. <laughs> I think that's where we are right now. I think we're on the cusp. Well, let's hone in on the gold and silver mining sector, because, Michael, you have obviously in this discussion alluded to the fact that you see tremendous potential value there. Obviously, it's a sector that's very beaten down, particularly the silver miners. And a lot of people are very wary of that sector for that reason, seeing it as kind of a widow maker sort of sector. Um, so I'm wondering if you could maybe more specifically discuss the opportunity you're seeing there. And also, for your average retail investor out there, is is the best way to play that sort of trend you're seeing in ETF, something like the GDX or perhaps a royalty streaming? Well, what's your thoughts there? Well, we examine also the miners on a relative performance basis. Any, any sector of the stock market is going to have outperforming members, components, underperforming and par performing. Okay. Same is true with the miners. Uh, you can look at Newmont, for example, over the last five, 10 years, and there have been periods where it's beat the pants off the mining sector. You know, where you long new mountain, you triple your money and GDX only doubles. OK, uh, and then there's periods over the last year and a half where new mountain sinks badly. Um, one of the problems with investors right now is most of their mentality is based upon what they've experienced over the last, let's say, three years since the surge in 2020. They've experienced they got in late. They're hurting badly. You know, the GDX was 45. It's now trading just under 30, you know, so, and that's a rally. Okay. So their mindset is based on recent reality. And I'm, we're arguing that recent reality is abnormal in terms of looking at the historic norms of the market. It's been extremely well contained, uh, not very volatile. Silver's not been very volatile if you look at it on a percentage basis. And when it wakes up, it shocks people when markets come out of these sort of compressed zones where everybody's bored to death for three years. And that's what you want if you're a bull, actually. You want to be have people surprised because uh, what happens? They chase it. <laughs> they chase it late. But meanwhile, you're already long. OK, so I think we're on the cusp of that. And I think, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out some numbers. If I get the breakout on GDX, that it's, it's above 31. It would be the breakout level on a monthly close. OK, the 3140 area. OK. Next month, it drops a little bit. Silver, 25, 27, monthly close this month. If you get those momentum breakouts, silver, I think, will rapidly blow through the 30 level. Over the next five to six months, silver will probably be somewhere well between the $30 high we saw in 2020, 2021, actually, and the, 50, the $250 highs. So it'd be some way up into the 30s, okay? It's a big percent move, okay? Miners will rapidly go back to their high. So GDX crossing through its annual structure is likely to go back to 45 in a heartbeat very quickly. Now you say, well, that's just back to the high where gold was in 2020, you know, in 2050. Okay. Gold's already above there. So they're still lagging gold. Yes. From that point of view, but from the present 
to getting back to the high in GDX, that's a huge percent gain. You go from 30 to 45, that's a 50% gain. Gold will not gain 50% during that time. You'll have the miners catch up. So again, it's an issue of rotation. There's times to be in the miners, there's times not to be. And as far as picking the best ones, <clears throat> that's a technical issue. Now, I know there's fundamental analysts out there, and we don't pretend to delve into that. But we measure the miners on a relative performance basis and, you know, spread charts. So you'll see a miner breakout versus GDX and its spread goes up, meaning it's beating GDX. That doesn't last forever. It may last two, three years. And then another miner will take its place, you know, et cetera. So it's a changing issue. Uh, right now, I tend to bet on the big blue chips. Uh, I think uh, they've been depressed pretty good over the last year and a half relative to the miners. And I think when they come back, it'll be a gusher. And Alistair, your thoughts on the gold and silver mining space at present? Yeah, it's, it's, I, it's rather boring because I rather rather agree with Michael on this. Um, I mean, my experience of uh, the sort of rotation we have in the markets is that, um, you know, when the momentum goes out of the tech stocks, whatever, whatever, um, then yes, there will be a panic to get out, but portfolios will rebalance towards, you know, whatever is performing. I mean, I'm not saying that these fund managers actually know what they're doing. They're just going where the action is. And the easiest thing for them to do in the initial stages is just buy the big names. And that's what they'll do. Um, but there is a huge, great problem, I think, within the investment management industry. And that is that um, there are very few analysts now uh, who actually follow the sector, who understand the sector. The sector has been starved of capital. There are no really big new, um, uh, you know, if you like, um, uh, 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 discoveries. Um, no new big mines coming on stream or something like that. Um, but I think that, you know, once it gets going a little bit, you'll find that um, what the big boys do is they let the, the exploration companies do the exploration and then they go and buy the exploration companies. So, you know, if you know what you're doing, that's going to be where the, you know, where the real money is going to be made. Um, and then, of course, there's the royalty. I, I love royalties. I mean, you know, I remember uh, when Franco Nevada came over to London. You know, I thought, God, this is a bloody good idea. But not many of my colleagues in London actually sort of thought it was a good idea. Um, I just like the idea of just sort of sitting back and, you know, coin coining in the cash while someone else is taking the risk. You know, So I think the royalty companies are probably worth looking at in that context. Um, so this is this is an interesting time. I mean, um, it's been very, very tough for anyone um, bottom fishing in this in 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 this market, but um, in general terms, um, the people I know who have really made good money anywhere in the stock market are the people who have gone for value and been patient, and I think that's probably going to come out now, particularly when you get the switch, if you like, and the weight of money starts coming out of the the bubble stuff, and then starts looking for. You know, what's what's performing? How am I going to protect myself in this market? I mean, that's going to be the premium. You know, when you get, um, you, know, when you, you know, as a fund manager, if you if you find yourself turning around to your clients and saying, well, you know, I know that um, your portfolio is down 20 percent, but the S&P is down 25. So I've beaten the market. It doesn't actually cut an awful lot of ice. <laughs> I mean, it really doesn't uh, because, you know, People think of their wealth in terms of, um, you know, accrual or or not. Um, you know, they couldn't give a damn about, uh, it, you know, relative performance and all the rest of it. So there's going to be big, big pressure, I think, to go into the mines once uh, this story switches. And they've missed the gold, the gold story completely. I mean, gold has gone up. And, um, you know, I know from my own personal experience, you know, trying to, talk um, uh, through, uh, you know, the sort of the psychology uh, in the West, nobody's long of it. And not only that, but if you look at the ETFs, they've been selling down ETFs. I, the, you know, I know that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of authorized participants will go in and they'll raid ETFs in order to get gold, which they feed into the market um, and hope to close the position later. I know that sort of thing goes on. But I mean, in the West, there has been zero interest in gold and gold is at an all time high. So what gives here? This is a fascinating, fascinating situation. I think it's potentially explosive. Very interesting thoughts. 
both of you have kind of already answered the next question I was going to ask throughout the conversation. So I'd like to finish with asking both of you any other sectors or areas of the market, whether that be commodities or elsewhere, that you're currently seeing value in. Um, and Alistair, I'll start with you. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I'm no longer in the investment business, um, so so uh, I can't really answer that in the with the detail that Michael will will uh, undoubtedly give you. But the one thing I would say is that um, there is a misnomer about commodity prices. Um, we have seen quite a few commodity prices begin to perk up, you know, things like copper and so on and so forth. And this is always taken by people as an indication that, um, you know, there is going to be demand for copper and isn't this wonderful or, you know, whatever the commodity is. Um, when you get quite a lot of commodities moving in that sort of direction, let's say a majority of them, then um, it may be telling you something different. And um, the reason this is very important is that uh, if you look at fiat currencies, the subjectivity in the price relationship between a fiat currency and a commodity is not necessarily in the commodity. It may well be in the currency. Now, what I mean by that is that rising commodity prices are reflecting the purchasing power of the currencies going down measured against the commodities rather than the commodities rising. It's a very, very important point. I don't think anyone, any of the uh, mainstream analysts actually take on this point. They really don't. And I, you know, also um, I find that commentators within, uh, for example, uh, you know, precious and base metals, they don't understand economics. They don't understand the economics of money and credit at all. Well, in fact, most people don't, but here it could be sadly lacking. And this is why I think it's very, very important to just hoist on board that the reason that commodity prices like, you know, and energy, oil, for example, I mean, WTI is what, 80, 81, 82 at the moment. It has risen partly, I'm sure, because of, you know, whatever factors, uh, you know, the analysts throw at us, um, but also because the purchasing power of the dollar is declining. That is the key. So this is, if you like, your escape from a declining dollar. And gold represents all these commodities, basically. Um, I mean, if you look at the uh, price of oil, for example, WT, WTI oil, I think was something like $2.53 a barrel from 1950 all the way through to early 1970. Then you had the, you know, the sort of suddenly the Arabs woke up to the, what was happening to, to, to the, the currency they were being paid in. And, um, you know, we're now looking at 80. If you look at the price of oil per barrel in gold, Instead of it going up from 253 to 80, having been 140 at one stage, incidentally, it has actually fallen by something like 20%. And it's been incredibly stable. I mean, if you put it just on an ordinary chart, you know, you've got the gold line just going boom, 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 like that, and dollar line doing that. And the same is true for all the other major currencies. So gold actually does reflect um, the situation in commodities in the general sense. I mean, commodities may double or halve against gold, but they certainly don't go up 80, 90 times. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think really what we're going to see, I think, in this new um, Bretton Woods era, which uh, um, uh, uh, Zoltan, uh, what was his name? I can't remember the ex Credit Suisse guy. You know, he christened Zoltan it. Posner, yeah, that's the fellow. He, he christened this Bretton Woods Three, which um, you know is actually drew our attention to the changed conditions, the conditions that we had in the seventies. Who, you know, which Michael remembers. We we're reminiscing about this. Um, you know, this this is the new this is the new situation. And um, you're going to see, I think, commodity, the whole of the commodity complex in terms of prices rising quite sharply. But of course, how um, mines will deal with this um, is not necessarily easy, because, um, you know, if you look at things like, um, you know, wages, you look at things like um, energy inputs, you look at all this rubbish about how they've now got to be environmentally friendly and all. I mean, the burden, the cost burden on mining, which is a dirty, dirty business, uh, is actually quite substantial. So it's not an easy, you know, it's not an easy relationship, if you like, between commodities and 
the mining industry. So it does require some expertise, but I would certainly draw your attention to um, what's going on in commodities. And it's not so much the commodities are rising, it's the purchasing power of our currencies going down. Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating way to frame it in relationship to the gold price as opposed to the US dollar. Michael, your thoughts on areas outside of the precious metal space that you're currently seeing potential value in? Well, we measure constantly the Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is a fairly well-balanced commodity index. Some of the others are too heavily weighted just to oil and so forth. Uh, in oct- it, you got to remember the commodities don't always correlate to gold. Uh, ultimately, they do over vast periods of time. But for instance, gold made a low in 2015 and doubled by 2020. Between 2015 and 2020, the Bloomberg Commodity Index continued to drift lower and didn't make its low in the high 50s in price, that is, for the Bloomberg, in the latter part of 2020. Gold had already doubled, okay? But then in October 2020, we put out a report that said commodity explosion coming. We, we based that on not just that it was dirt cheap, but our technical analysis. And we Bloomberg doubled in the next year or so. It went from a price of around 60, 70. We had a breakout at 70. It went to 140. Is Bloomberg Commodity Index. Now, of course, everybody ranted and raved about inflation's off the page, et cetera. If you actually look at the Bloomberg, which is now back down to 100, okay, it's oscillating on either side of 100, and we think it's basing for another up move. We think, it, in fact, we think the breakout for that is very, very soon. Uh, okay, so we're at 100 in Bloomberg. It's 140 in 2022. By the way, it peaked around the time of the Ukraine Russia war. Okay, so it, it didn't cause the move, that, that ended the move. Okay. But if you go back and look at 2008 and 2011 peaks in the Bloomberg Commodity Index, the Bloomberg Commodity Index was at 235 in 2008, and it was 170 plus in 2011 when gold peaked. It's traded at 100 now, and people are saying inflation's off the page. It's never, yeah, the rate of change from this year to last year might have been off the page in percentage terms, but in real, you know, dollar denominated, it's dirt cheap still. So it's an asset category that when you look back 20 years or so, you say, gee, this is in the lower quadrant of the past 20 years. So it's not exactly overpriced. And technically, we think it's right for the second leg up. First leg was that October 2020 to March of 2022. Uh, and go back and look at the late 70s when the, the commodity indexes were during that time, commodities went up dramatically, especially the late 70s. They were a bit lagged to gold in that last upturn. About a year after gold made its low in 1976 at 103. In fact, I was standing next to the pit when that when that occurred, <laughs> not in the pit. Uh, it went to 850 by 1980. Commodities in 1977 turned up following gold, and they had a dramatic move up. And yet we were in a recessionary type of environment, uh, and the stock market wasn't performing. So they didn't need both a good economy to drive commodities up. It was a monetary issue. The central banks create monetary flows. Investors don't always put it where the Fed might want it to go. Now, recently, the you know, last 12 dozen years, they put it into the stock market. Well, when that bubble breaks, that money flow that they'll no doubt add to the, the liquidity situation is going to go somewhere else. And I think a lot of asset managers are going to perceive one, gold, silver, and so forth. But they're also going to look at commodities and realize, hey, these guys really are kind of cheap. And we're starting to see that now in copper, for example. It's breaking out over some significant levels on momentum. Uh, the grains in particular, uh, that's one area we think during the, the 2020 to 2022 move, the energy sector dominated the move. Now, it, it was well balanced in the, in the overall commodity sector, but energy was the outperforming component. I think the grains are likely to be the outperformer this time, uh, soybeans, corn, and wheat. This is a technically based thing. Uh, and of course, that's just what the, the governments of the world want, right? Of food prices to go up. You know, that, that makes the population real happy and stable, okay? Uh, and uh, that's another factor you have to enter, put into the markets here that is seldom discussed. And that is, we call it a tab- tabula rasa event. The total upset of political stability. And we're starting to see that around the world in, in some good ways, like, you know, in Argentina, for example. Uh, but it, it's not just there. It's it's also here. We could feel it. And we, I, even a year ago in some interviews, I said, you know, this is not going to be a copacetic outcome. 
this election year. There's no way you can have the outcome. And everybody says, oh, OK, it's not going to happen. University of Virginia did a study in October. And I'll uh, let's see if I can quote from it. But basically, they came up with the conclusion that. Uh, and this is quite frightening. Department of Politics, University of Virginia, staggering majority of both Biden, 70 percent, and Trump, 68 percent voters believed electing officials from the opposite party would result in lasting harm to the U.S. Another point, roughly half of Biden voters, 52 percent, and 47 percent of Trump voters viewed those who supported the other party as threats to the American way of life. Next, 40 percent of both groups, 41 percent of the Biden voters, 38 percent of the Trump voters, at least somewhat believed that the other side had become so extreme that it's acceptable to use violence to prevent them from achieving their goals. OK, there's no outcome to this election that will be copacetic. That is not factored into markets. Uh, that's the kind of thing the tablecloth comes off and everything is shattered. And, and it's hard to define the wave effects, but it's there. And it's all part of the economic problem, too. It's not like they're un disconnected. So when this thing comes apart, stock market starts down, gold continues up. We start to get data points following the stock market down. Uh, and then you have this event coming up. It's going to be fun. <laughs> position. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Certainly frightening to think about, but, th but something that we do have to keep in consideration when we think about these things. Um, well, thank you both so much for joining us today. It's been an incredible conversation. Before I do let you go, Alistair, could you tell us about gold money and your Substack? Yeah, go, I mean, basically, gold money is a very, very simple business. It allows people to buy gold um, and silver and platinum group metals if they wish and store them in um, a range of vaults around the world, all fully insured, LBMA compliant, you know, I mean, proper vaults. So, um, you know, we have uh, a lot of business uh, uh, in America and also the UK, also elsewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it allows ordinary people, say, to store their gold in Switzerland. So it does make a, set, a lot of sense, I think, from the point of view of those who don't want the insecurity of having uh, their wealth um, in the form of tangible wealth uh, stored at, at, at home. So so that's basically what gold money does. Um, I set up my Substack um, at the beginning of January, really because uh, I, I, I could see that uh, the dollar was breaking down. I mean, that's my my way of putting the gold, you know, the gold price rising, if you like. Um, and I, I, I have a mission really to try and educate people as to exactly what is going on. Um, and uh, this is very, very much needed. Um, you can only really protect your assets when you get a collapse in um, the value of credit. Uh, if you actually know what you're doing, if you know what is going on and why. And, um, you know, I can see that uh, ordinary individuals, you know, looking at gold as a trading counter, which is completely the wrong way to look at it, you know, would think, oh, well, it's gone up to 21. Where are we? 21.54, you know, at the moment. I, I think, you know, it might tick back and I'll buy it. And it was, you know, and, and they miss it. You know, it won't happen because apart from anything else, when it ticks back, they'll say to themselves, uh, oh, well, you know, it obviously wasn't, you know, it was a bit, <laughs> you know, thank God we didn't buy it. You know, it's, a, it, it's not a trading counter. That's the key thing. So I need to educate as many people as will listen. And I hope it will be lots and lots of people who, who will listen. And that's why I set up the substract, because it involves politics, it involves geopolitics, it involves economics. It involves a deep understanding of money and credit and the difference between the two, which incidentally, very few economists actually do understand. So it's really all that. And um, I'm just hoping that um, I can do a lot of good for ordinary people to protect them from what's going on. And that's that's why I've set up the Substack. Excellent. Well, I'll put links to both Gold Money and your Substack in the description below for people who want to check that out. Michael, tell us about Momentum Structural Analysis. Oh, I've been around since '92, <laughs> so what's that? Thirty-two years. Uh, we've we analyze all four asset categories: stock markets, uh, not just U.S. but others, uh, debt markets, foreign exchange, and commodities. With emphasis on gold and silver. Uh, 
and it's very important this day and age, especially to interface these. Don't just if you're in gold, don't just look at gold. You're missing too much. It's the movement of the stock market, especially at a given time, and, and what it inflicts on the Fed and central banks and and average people, and and helps spark gold. So all the interrelationship between the tectonic plates is important. So uh, you know, if you're interested in checking out our work, go to our website, Oliver MSA. You can understand what we're doing, basically the, our concept of analysis. And uh, request a sample. Uh, under my picture, there's an email address and request it. I'll send you some sample reports. Uh, but uh, it's a unique vantage point. It's not We don't just look at price charts like everybody else. Great. Well, I'll put a link to Momentum Structural Analysis in the description below as well for people who want to check that out. Thank you once again, gentlemen, for joining us. It's been an honor. It's my pleasure, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse.